I'm standing um, here in the garden of uh, 161 Holland Park Avenue where a plaque has been put up to commemorate the life of Eugene Sandow. Now, Eugene Sandow was, was born in 1867 um, as Friedrich Müller, the son of a greengrocer. Sandow was capable of extreme feats of strength and he was also a canny Prussian entrepreneur. Many parts of Sandow's act as a, as, as a Victorian strongman were um, marked by uh, classical imagery and the use of uh, particularly classical sculpture. I've been talking to David Waller, the author of A Perfect Man, a biography of Eugene Sandow. He went off, you know, as a teenager, I guess, to Italy and they looked at um, the great classical works of art and uh, he was particularly taken by uh, the physique of um, the, the statues that he saw uh, uh, and the paintings that he saw and um, he and his father both could not believe that uh, this, I this ideal form that he saw uh, in these classical works could in any way be replicated in, in the modern world. In other words, modern civilization uh, was not a patch on the, the level of uh, strength, beauty and manhood that um, people had achieved many thousands of years ago. He could recreate um, the conditions of classical perfection uh, in the modern world. And that's what he did with his own body. I've been joined today on my Searching for Sandow expedition by Anthony Ellis, um, a scholar from the University of Edinburgh. Now you may wonder what it was that killed the man reputed to be the strongest man in the world. And the answer is apparently a stroke at the age of 58 at his home in Holland Park. After he died, his body was brought here to Putney Vale Cemetery, where it lay for 77 years in an unmarked grass grave. His wife insisted, so the story goes, that he be left in an unmarked grave to get revenge for his infamous philandering. In 2002, an admirer set up a monument, not the one we see here, which in 2008 was replaced with this one and a half ton pink sandstone monolith, modelled apparently on a Greek stele. Now Eugene Sandow, when he arrived in Britain, he became very famous on the music hall scene. By 1901, he'd moved from the music hall to the Royal Albert Hall. His challenge, like that of any music hall artist, was to constantly reinvent his act so that it was, it was interesting. And, and you know, most strongmen of that time, you know, it wasn't very interesting when they did a few tricks and you know, the audience would gasp, but after a while it got boring. And one of the ways that he managed to um, make himself appealing to the audience was by doing poses, uh, replicating um, great uh, classical statues, so Discobulus or, or the dying gladi gladiator or Hercules with his club. There is this, this idea that, that classical culture can be used to lift something, to make it more legitimate culturally and, and therefore take it up, up to high, higher class culture. Mm. But on the other hand, he also was using classical culture to extend the reach in all directions, up and down. Now, how did he do this? Back to David Waller. He helped reach out to, I think, all strata of uh, late Victorian society. It was uh, certainly uh, appealing to um, the upper echelons, in the sense that they were steeped in classical culture. Um, and um, it, would be, it would be language, body language, that would be immediately recognised um, and appreciated. And I think also, in that sense, it, it worked with the lower orders who would come along to see his show um, and um, see this as um, you know, something that perhaps belonged to, to their betters, but he was nevertheless making it accessible um, to all.